We exalt your great name. Come on, can somebody just cry out to him? God, we need you tonight. God, we exalt you in this place. God, we call on your name that represents salvation and mercy and grace, God, and strength and power. God, it represents healing in this place. So, Father, we call on you tonight, God. We worship you, Jesus. We exalt you. I wonder if you could lift your voice right now and put your hands together for a great God, a great King. We worship you, Jesus. God, we call on your name right now in faith, with trust and hope, God. We worship you as our only hope tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it. We cry out. Jesus, have mercy. Jesus, we cry out. We need you. Have mercy upon us, oh God, tonight. God, we've come here to worship you. God, we've come here to magnify your great name. Hallowed be thy name. On a Saturday night, hallowed be thy great name. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, there's nobody like you. We exalt you. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, 
of faith. Power in your name. There's power. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in your name. Come on. Sing it to him. There's power in Jesus. God, you deserve the glory. You deserve all the praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. To 
you deserve the glory. Come on, can you just close your eyes? Come on, focus your mind upon him. Oh, we worship you tonight, Jesus. We're here to magnify your great name. You deserve it all, Jesus. All the glory and the honor, Lord. Lord, we worship you tonight. Magnify oh, you deserve the glory. It all belongs to you. It belongs to your great name. Your saving name. For what it represents. Magnify oh, you deserve the glory. tonight. God, everything I have, God, I give you tonight. As we magnify, One more time. You deserve the glory. You deserve the glory. And the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in adoration and praise. As we magnify your name. You deserve the glory. Cause Lord, we lift our hands. God, we lift our hands right now. We surrender, Lord. For you are great. You do miracles. God, I'm a miracle standing here tonight. Because of your mercy and your grace. There's no one else like you. For you are great. God, you called me when I was dead with my trespasses and sins.
Lord. Can you sing, I need your mercy? Somebody cry out, I need your grace. From the depths of your soul, I need your mercy. I need your grace. song. I need your grace. I need your Come on, cry out. I need your mercy. I need your grace. I need your hand. Just lead it away. I can't make it without you. Come on, it doesn't matter what it looks like or what it sounds like. Can you just cry out with me? Come on. I need your mercy. I need your mercy, Jesus. I need your mercy. Have mercy upon me. Yes. I need your mercy. I gotta have your grace. I need your grace. Without it tonight, I need it in my life. I need mercy. Somebody sing mercy. Somebody sing, I need your mercy. I gotta have your mercy. Once and for all, I remind you of your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Your strong mercy, your mercy. I gotta have your mercy. Can't live another breath without your mercy. Yes, pour it out, pour it out. me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever my brothers and sisters I believe that that is heaven because I'm not going to dwell on this earth forever but if I will continue to walk in his mercy and grace 
one of these days I'm going to step into the portals of heaven and I'm just going to live in his eternal presence forever by his mercy and his grace. How many of you are grateful for the mercies of God? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercies. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mercy and grace go hand in hand. Albeit they are not the same thing. Christianity throws them around like they're synonymous. But they're not. Oh, but they are equally important. How many of you are glad that mercy got to you before truth did? was it the psalmist said mercy and truth have kissed each other Whew. thank God mercy got the truth before I did amen how about you I don't want justice and neither does anybody else that say they do mercy Mercy. Mercy. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. I have purposed this year to be more intentional in worship. It's easy to get caught up in our songs because they're very melodious and they just move your spirit. Every once in a while, Brother Ralph, I like just to slow down and think about what they're saying. So if y'all see me maybe not singing with you, I'm pondering what you're saying. You deserve the glory because you're the only one that can perform a miracle. And there's several of us in this building today that are recent miracles. remember when they called my room and said your father may not make it through the night I said God I can't do anything about this but you can I plead your blood I plead your blood How many of you are a miracle? Wait, is it? You shall. We got in the car the other day. I was talking about something that could have happened, might have happened. Oh, yeah. That last ice storm we had, I fell on my caboose again. And I was so frustrated, Brother Grant. I was on my way out of town, and I was late. Brother Lane was expecting me for dinner, and I was already a few minutes late. I stepped up on that little concrete pad they got for pouring gas, you know, dispensing gas there at Casey's, and nobody had salted that joker, and I went off of it. Just I stepped up, went off the other side just like that in about that much slushy water. My pride was hurt. Guy went by me in a truck just looking down at me. Hi. My back was hurt. My head smacked the pavement and my head hurt. And I was a mess. Slushy, gassy water. Hopped back up, hoping nobody saw me. Too late. So after all the events that took place, I got back in the truck and I'm not happy about the whole thing. <clears throat> my wife said, Jeffrey, you don't know what that may have spared us down the road. In the old song we used to sing, we may not know, we may not tell how we are saved from death and hell. But through faith we know that all is well. Come on. I have purpose to live my life intentionally. In worship, in word, 
Be careful what words you use. Power of life and death is in the tongue, and most of the time it's to ourself. You can talk yourself into something, you can talk yourself right out of something, including miracles, including an anointing. So I begin trying to quote the scripture more often to my dilemmas and my situations and my perceptions and my opinions. And then finally, indeed, if you intend to do something for God or something good, it's not just going to happen. How many of you got good intentions? We'll live intentionally. Let's see what God will do in 2021. My God, it's got to be better in 2020. It is because I ain't running no more. How about you? Pastor, I never was running. Well, good for you. Some of us had sense. No, I'm just kidding. It's a crazy world we live in, brothers and sisters. And I'm not just talking about the virus. You can't help but look at our world and say, whoa, something's happening. Something's stirring up. Something that's happening in this world. Physically, obviously, COVID's on the loose and it's got another brother. It's dragging along behind a ear. Whatever. I'll be careful, but is what it is. And then the moral fabric of our society. What happened last year? What happened to America last year? Across the board, I don't care who you are, what political affiliation or not you hold yourself to, what ethnicity you're of, what happened to our world last year? You can't have physical and moral. That's the, bo that's the uh, body and soul without affecting the spiritual climate of society. The enemy's doing everything he can to come against the church. Everything he can possibly be bringing against the church. But you know what? There's something about the church that thrives in persecution. Bring hardship and difficulty to the church, and it just refines us and refocuses us. He used to be a whole lot smaller than he is now. And we used to fight like cats and dogs. Um, I, I didn't mean since COVID. <laughs> when we were growing up, I was four, I'm still bigger than he is, but I was four years older than he was. But there was a fire and tenacity in him. He just loved to poke the bear. Oh, he'd make me so mad. And we'd us and carry on. Ain't nobody could light my fire like he could. But you let an outside source. You let an outside source step into the ring and all of a sudden it's back to back. It's my brother. Sorry. He, he may have just punched me in the mouth and I may have just blacked his eye. But he's still my brother. That's my scratching post. That's what Bishop used to say, you know, cats scratch on stuff. They don't like you scratching on it. This is my punching bag. The enemy did everything he could to slip junk in to the church cause issues in the church and as a pastor can nobody see it except God better than the pastor you see this going and that going and that going you're like oh God what God says hang on COVID's coming hang on an upheaval's coming hang on something's coming's going to make the church say you know what that's my brother 
We may have our differences, but that's my brother. That's my sister. And we have the same father. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. I'm excited to see what this year's bringing. I believe a unity that we've never seen before. I really do. And in that spirit of unity, God commands his blessing. Even life. Oh, somebody finish that for me. I think, again, we're talking about heaven. We're talking about the eternal spirit of God. I believe we're talking about that end time revival. When brothers and sisters come together in unity, God said, there I'll command my blessing, even life forevermore. What is life forevermore? It's the Holy Ghost within us. So if you and I want an out, how many of you want an outpouring of the presence of God? How many of you want an outpouring of a revival in our land as well as harvest? God, revive the souls of men and women that have known you and God, use it to draw men and women who have yet to know you unto yourself in the holy name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles with me, I'd like to go to a passage of Scripture. I'm going to do my best to... Uh, not go as long as I did last week because Monday and Tuesday were shot. I think I got out of bed to go back to the chair and then got out of the chair to go back to bed. My wife asked me today, she said, how you feeling, hon? I said, slow. Slow. But we're still heading in the right direction. John chapter 19 and verse 34. You've heard me preach from this passage of Scripture many times. But I'm going to slow down a little bit. Because I think uh, in my pursuit to get to the good stuff, how many of you ever jump over Scriptures to get to that good stuff you know that's coming? You know your Bible well enough. You know the promises that are on the other side of that. You just, oh, get to that good stuff. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. Oh, Jesus, thank you. But I, I. And forthwith came there out blood and water. Ask me about that after church, Shelley. Something just opened up to me right there. And I'll forget. One of the soldiers pierced with a spear, pierced his side. Forthwith came there out blood and water. Oh, let me just throw it out there. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. I'll probably develop a sermon around it. But we need to live our lives in such a way that whenever we are pierced by hurts and pains from this world, the only thing that comes out is forgiveness and grace. I don't know that I'm there yet, but I'm trying. Thank you for your word, God. It's a lamp to my feet. Oh, God, thank you. It directs my paths. I don't know what I'd do. I don't know where I'd be if I didn't have your word to know how to love you, to know that I could love you, to know that I was, it was possible to be accepted and, and adopted into the blood. God, I wouldn't know that if it were not for your word. Thank you. God, it, it leads me, it guides me, it directs me, it, it transforms me, it shows me areas of my life that I can do better in with your grace. Thank you for it. And I ask today to anoint my lips, give me strength. Move through us today. I feel your presence so sweet and so gentle, so near in this room, God, as if you would just draw us close to you. Minister to every individual in this room. Let your word go forth and God give a word of healing. Give a word of direction. Give a word, oh God, of deliverance. Deliverance, God, from our own concepts and our own thoughts that plague us. Send your word and heal us, oh God, I pray. And we will give you the glory and thank you, oh Lord. In Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. God bless you. Turn around and tell three or four people they look beautiful in the house of the Lord. You can be seated.
I do want to say how beautiful it, you look to be back in the house of God. Oh, Brother Lash, isn't it nice to preach to full seats? Worship with full seats? <laughs> you want to preach? Ne- well, no, hey, next week, next weekend, Saturday and Sunday, Brother Greg Randall will be with us. Be the, I am so excited about this. It's the first time that we've had him since he's been sick. And uh, he's going to be with us Saturday and Sunday. And uh, would you would you just take a day this week and fast and pray about that? How many of you notice that we're not doing our annual fasting and prayer for the first? Do you want to know why? It's not because I forgot. There's no need to add fasting to affliction. I just didn't feel it time in the Holy Ghost to... Uh, to put that burden on the people of God when we're already dealing with so much that's going on. So um, I would ask you, though, take a week, a day this week, take a week this day and and fast for services this next weekend. And uh, come expecting. Amen. Praise God. So I want to talk to you from this subject, mercy, the qualifier of grace. Mercy, the qualifier of grace. I know I've preached from this message, from this text before. Forthwith came out blood and water, and the blood representing the blood that would cover humanity and cover the sins of the world. And, and water always represented spirit, the spirit of, of God, and, and how the, the blood represents mercy for our past. And the spirit of Christ in us changes us, which is the grace that we live in to become who he's called us to be. And focus a lot of times on that grace side. In fact, I've said before, if we'd live more by the grace of God, we wouldn't rely as heavily upon the mercies of God. Because the the grace of God changes us from who we were and makes us who we ought to be. And as long as I'm living in who I was, I'm in desperate need of mercy constantly. Now, we all are constantly in need of mercy, and that, that's the, the concern that I have is perhaps in my focusing on grace side of this scripture that I have uh, perhaps run off and left grace in some of your minds, and that, that's not been my intent at all. I asked my daughter a loaded question the other day. I asked her if she would want somebody to tell her about something she needed to change in her character if it would make her a better person. And she replied in much the same manner most of us would. Why? Are you about to tell me something that I need to change? Receiving my answer to my question from her response, I was able to smile and say, not at all. I just wanted to know if you would be receptive. You see, her physical response told me a lot about volumes about human nature that her verbal response never could express. The vast majority of us want to be a better person. The vast majority of us want to be a better person, but we are scared to death of the process. I'm convinced that if the truth was spoken, if somehow I could muster up all the love, compassion, and character of God and approach an individual and tell them the truth in love, they would grasp it and adhere to it in a moment. We would be compelled to perfection and not afraid of facing reprisal rather than reproof and rebuke. I fear so often we judge God by human standards and not by his word. Our concept comes with mercy and asking mercy of God, the same as asking forgiveness from another individual. Whether how they're going to respond or how we feel, a lack of COVID moment, a lack of uh, that we need, not we need mercy, but that we can obtain mercy, that we qualify for mercy. You see, if Jesus would tell Peter to forgive 70 times 7, in other words, quit keeping score, how much more forgiveness would pour from God's pure heart? I want to talk to you about mercy, asking for mercy, 
the act and the characteristic of mercy in the life of a believer because it's a qualifier for grace to operate in our hearts and lives. Peter could only see the face value of humanity and he was asked to forgive without keeping track. What about the one that determined your value by his precious blood? You see, in today's society, our, the value of a person, who was it said put a 10 on the forehead of every person that you meet? The value of our persons is in the effectiveness that we can produce in society tends to be. Though we don't like to admit it, we tend to judge ourselves by that. I remember when I was a kid, I'd tell my mom, I love you, and she said, only when I perform. It's usually after I ask her to make something that I really liked or whatever. Sometimes we get that concept of God. That God expects us to be able to be effective and perfect. And we have to qualify for mercy. If you're drawing breath, that you qualify. What about the God that determined your value by his precious blood? What about the one who determined your purpose through his divine understanding and knowledge? You see, I love my family deeply. As deeply as I possibly can. But my wife has brought to my attention on more than one occasion where it would have been best for me to applaud the effort given and not point out the mistakes made. Did you get that? It's not that I don't want what's good for my family and I can't see the good that my family does. It's just I want what's best for them. And by doing it just a little bit different, they could have attained it. Oh, the folly of a I can fix it, Dad. Anybody else out there can feel a little bit of that. We are fixers, so we tend to see problems than the perfection of effort. Much to our own hurt. Much to our own hurt. This is not proprietary to only dads. But life teaches all of us that. Yeah, I appreciate that, but if you'd have done it this much better, the company could have had it this much better. I constantly ask, how can you do better to save the company more money? Are you kidding me? I just stayed awake for three days straight. I just looked at it with a microscope. I cut everything down to my toenails. Can you do just a little bit better? The philosophy of success in our world demands that we be valued according to our efficiency and nearness to perfection regardless of our age or sex. Now I'm going somewhere. Hang on with me. I'm concerned that in my pursuit of the power of grace making itself manifest in our lives, I have somehow maybe diminished the importance, necessary, necessity, or value of ta- obtaining daily mercy in our life. I want what's best for the church. I want what's best for you. But I also realize there's not a one of us that are perfect. And that means we are going to have to continually go to the cross. We are going to have to continually go past the blood that was shed for us. We're going to have to continually obtain mercy. I love to teach and preach about grace. I love to. There's something about grace. I'll tell you the truth, for the granted, points away from my wrongs. Grace points to what I can be. The anointing of grace shows me how my life can be transformed into something that is profitable to the kingdom. And sometimes I don't realize it's, it's my humanity that makes me profitable to the kingdom. 
You see, it was through his humanity that God brought the world into reconciliation with righteousness. It wasn't his healing the sick, raising the dead, turning water into wine. It was when he suffered that last drop of blood and it crushed his heart. His humanity. Grace. It's a place of forever in my vision because it's a place of favor. It's a place of godly purpose. It's a place of anointing that validates us that we are allowing that grace, that God to change who we are into who he's called us to be. Grace is a beautiful place where God showcases that miraculous power to the world, enabling them to view just how glorious his gospel is. Mercy is a bloody cross. Mercy's not so beautiful. Until you need it. Mercy, on the other hand, focuses upon, I failed and I need help. It's a bloody picture of sacrifice made by love in spite of my wrongs. Mercy. Mercy points back to my conversation with my daughter. We want to be right, but our wrongs scare us to death. So we would like to forget about mercy sometimes. We would like to, when I say mercy, I mean sometimes we'd like to forget that we need forgiveness. Isn't it amazing and telling about humanity that God prepared a solution for our wrongs before he ever gave Adam a purpose? In fact, before he said, let there be light, he had already made provision for your and my wrongs. Revelation tells us that he was a lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. Mercy came before grace. Don't ever be ashamed to stop by the throne of grace to obtain mercy. But therefore, God prepared mercy before there was ever a sin. You see, we have the wrong view of mercy. You see, it's not a limitless license to sin. But it is the hope for every believer who would confess his sin while coming back boldly before the throne of grace, the throne of power, to obtain mercy. Why do I go before this throne of grace? It's not to obtain power, Brother Grant. It's to obtain mercy. Through that mercy, I obtain power. Let's dissect that. We all know, uh, we, most of us know that Scripture for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. That simply means we do have a high priest that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. God knows what you're going through. The Bible says he knows your frame. It's just dust. It's not platinum. It's not gold. It's not diamonds. It's not precious stones. You don't expect much out of dirt, do you? He's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly. That's the context. He knows you're weak. He knows you're human. He knows who you are. He knows your tendencies to fall. He knows your weaknesses. He said, and in spite of all that, I want you to come boldly. Well, 
come dragging your head. Don't come worrying. Don't come fearful, but come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. And by obtaining mercy, we're going to find grace to help in time of need. Come on. Great mercy is your qualifier for grace. You got to get mercy before grace can operate. You got to have the blood before the spirit can be applied. Mercy is the qualifier for grace. You and I will not find grace until we obtain mercy. So don't let the enemy condemn you. Listen, you're not perfect. You're not going to be perfect. The enemy wants to jump in the middle of, your, of our mess. We know we want to be right. Remember, everybody wants to be a better person. But we're scared to death of the process. And the enemy wants to scare us to death of the process. But, the, but Jesus Christ said to the, to the apostle, come boldly before the throne of grace. I know all about it already. Brother Kitty, some days I wake up and I say, God, I need your mercy because I'm Jeffrey. I haven't done anything yet. I haven't said anything to anybody yet. I haven't even thought anything yet. But the alarm clock just went off. And I need your mercy. Mercy is the blood that does away with our sin so God can begin to transform our life. So don't let the enemy condemn you. Gets in your brains and the first thing he does is want to condemn you, bring condemnation. Now I've said this many times but there's, there's some people here that perhaps haven't heard it. The difference between conviction and condemnation. Boy, they both sound similar, don't they? Here we go, mercy and grace. Let's just throw them in the same box. No, they are worlds apart. Conviction is the spirit of God that begins to deal with your heart and says, hey, you've done wrong. And godly sorrow worketh. Well, who do I have to repent to? Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Who do I have to repent to? God, therefore I have to come boldly. It doesn't say brashly, brazenly, with confidence. If I could just get into the, if I could just get into the presence of God, it's going to be okay. If I could just get in the presence of Daddy, it's going to be all right. He knows my frame. He knows I'm dust. He knows I'm weak. And if I could get him in his presence, Dad's going to fix it. And he's not going to point out you could have done better here. You should have done this here. Ha! Uh -uh. No. I was afraid. Why were you afraid, Adam? Because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? You didn't hear it from me. Come on, when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and the enemy knows it, so he wants to get between you and God with condemnation. Conviction says you're wrong. This was wrong, but here's how you get right. Look, there's a bloody cross and the blood still flows from Calvary. It reaches to the highest mountain. It reaches to the lowest valley. It reaches to your worst sin. It reaches to your worst nightmare. The blood still works. The enemy wants to get in there with this thing. It kind of sounds like conviction. It's called condemnation. Thank you, Bishop, for teaching me this as a young man. I use it continually. Conviction says you're wrong. It don't even, sometimes, Bishop, it don't even point at your sin. It just says you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You've been wrong. You'll never get right. You can't fix it. You can't do right. This is who you are. This is all you'll ever be. You can't get over this. You're just going to have to live with this. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Old things pass away and all things become new in Christ Jesus. Come on, you may have a, a nature that's given to wrath. You may have a nature that's given to whatever. But Peter tells us we are partakers of a divine nature. 
Condemnation says, you're wrong. You can't fix it. God don't want you. You, 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 you have messed up. You, you, don't deserve, you don't deserve forgiveness. That's when you ought to just jump up and say, you are absolutely right. It doesn't matter what I deserve. It matters what he says. And I'm going to go back to his word, which says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He makes his mercies new each and every day. Come on. I'm going to go right back to the word of God where he told Peter to forgive 70 times 7. And if that's his heart, I know he'll take me back. Brother Kleindens, an evangelist, said something. He was standing right over here, and it rocked my world, Sister Grant. He said, it don't matter how many times a backslider comes back, we ought to accept them every time they come back. He said, because the devil will. We cannot be more exclusive than Satan. So you know what? When, when you mess up, don't fall for that trick of condemnation. Conviction says, yes, I was wrong, but you can come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy. And that mercy is going to help you be stronger so you don't fall there the next time. But you got to get mercy. You got to get mercy. Now I got to hurry. We who have received the salvation, the presence of the living God, are not beyond the need of receiving mercy. I know we'd like to think that we're beyond sinning, but that concept only brings condemnation. If the Apostle Paul said, I die daily, that meant there was things that he was struggling with. It was the Apostle Peter that the Apostle Paul rebuked because he was wrong. And over and over in Scripture we read where we ought to forgive, where we ought to console, where we ought to save the backslidden, a brother that's fallen, a sister. So to try to forget that we need mercy every day, and I'm bringing this up because I have pounded through your skulls that you need to ask the grace of God to work in you every day. Well, in order to get that grace of God, you and I have to obtain mercy. It's the qualifier for that grace. And if we think that we're beyond sinning, that concept brings condemnation into our heart because we know we're not perfect. How many of you know you're not perfect? For the rest of you, just let me tell you, you're not. Sorry. John, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8 through 9. If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves. Now let me tell you, I don't want to deceive myself. Brother Arnold says that he prays every morning, God, don't let me be deceived. Don't let me deceive myself. And the truth is not in us. You know, the scripture says that there are going to be those that are lost because they didn't have a love for truth. And they allowed themselves to be deceived. He says, so if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And verse 9 is that beautiful scripture I've been quoting. But if we confess our sins. He didn't say if we sin and confess. He said if we confess our sins. Sometimes my sin, Brother Staten, is just opening my eyes in the morning. I already got a bad attitude. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It would do us well to remember that we are imperfect and still need of the mercies of God. Not just because of our own sensitivity toward God, but our sensitivity towards others. I'm telling you, God's going to bring an end time revival and harvest. Revival and harvest. And some of you have more trouble with the revival than the harvest. Because to revive means to bring alive that which used to be, bring it back from the dead and make it alive again. Similar to this is your brother who was dead and is now alive. 
And I'm just going to touch here and go, I could probably just stop right now and, and let, pick up in two weeks. But Holy Ghost put this on my heart last week when I finished my message. God's going to revive and bring back those that have been here before. And some of you got issues with those that left. Do you know the merciful obtain mercy? I'm telling you, God put me through it in a hospital bed last two months, two months ago, three months ago, whatever it was. I said, God, I've got to have mercy regardless. I don't care what's been done. I don't care what's been said. I don't care. It ain't about them. It's about me and you. And I've got to make it. So let it go. Let it go. Come on. God's going to bring people through them doors that perhaps you have an older brother attitude towards. When I'm talking about the, the prodigal son. Pastor, how do I deal with that? Obtain mercy in your own life first. I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but he said, you pick out the, the beam in your own eye, and then you can see clearly to take out the, uh, the moat in your brother's eye. I'm convinced that those of us that would be judgmental need to go by the throne of grace and find mercy for some things that we're scared to face. Let me tell you, God's gentle. He is so gentle. He's not, he doesn't want to afflict us willingly, the Bible says. Watch this, John chapter 8, 5 and 10. My Lord, I'm, there's no way. Moses, they caught the woman in the act of adultery. They had their law. They had their system of, what, of justice, what was right. You've brought this up, Bishop, before. I want to know how they knew when and where to find her. And where was the he? And if they known about this, why didn't they deal with it before? You know, the enemy knows how to save things for revival. Just for a convenient season. Yeah, he just lets that, he lets that go. And you think, oh, that's okay. And you let the Holy Ghost start moving. The church start going like crazy. And all of a sudden, something in us just rises up. Jesus is in the temple, and man, he is having a, he's having a wonderful time teaching and talking. I'm telling you, the Spirit of God's moving, and all of a sudden, that judgmental spirit bursts through the back door. And a woman who needed his mercy more than anything else was thrown at the feet of Jesus. Now, justice says... And Jesus could, I, I don't know, maybe he did it with his finger in the dust. Just start saying, you want to talk about justice? How about your backbiting tongue? How about your unbelief? How about, I don't know what he was writing, but it was enough to make every last one of them turn around and walk out the door. What do you say? Verse 10, when Jesus had lifted himself up and saw none but the woman, he said, woman, where are those thine accusers? And maybe I'm stretching here. I don't believe it. He said, hath no man condemned thee? I believe in that moment she realized who stood before her. And she said, no man, Lord. The only one that has the right to throw that rock is God manifest in flesh, and he's standing in front of me. And she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus qualified that statement. He said, neither do I. Neither do I. Would you stand with me? 
Come on, there may be some things in your life that has drugged you, as it were, into the presence of God and tried to condemn you in the presence of Almighty God. And that's the best place it could. If you are going to confront me with my wrongs, please do it right here. If you're going to throw my weaknesses and my failures in my face, please do it in the presence of Almighty God, the judge of all the earth, because he's going to do what's right by him. And he said, I didn't come into this world to condemn the world, but through me, you might have life. Every head bowed, every eye closed in this place today. I I am going to open these altars. If you want to put your mask on and come back down to an altar, just tell him, God, for whatever reason, I have may have skipped, jumped over mercy. I've been looking for grace everywhere. Wow. Pastor made it clear tonight that mercy is a qualifier. The spirit come after the blood. Your anointing comes after mercy. God, there's some areas of my life that I I don't know my way out of. I I don't know how it's going to be fixed. There's some areas of my life, God, that, oh, Lord, if justice were handed down, I, I don't know what I would do. know how I would respond. I, but God, your word says if I come confidently before your throne of help and power that I can obtain mercy. God, I, I, want, I want to confront my weaknesses. I want to confront my failures. I want to confront my wrongs, but I want to do it in the presence of your your warm embrace. I want to do it in the presence of your gentleness, in the presence of your compassions. I don't want to confront it, oh God, in the face of my enemy. I don't want to confront it anywhere else, but in the sweet presence of Almighty God. So God, here I come. Willingly, God, there's nothing here that's going to compel me, compel you. Nobody's going to drag you. But if in your heart, in your, in your spirit, you know there's something that you need to take to an altar, to a throne of grace and obtain mercy for. Maybe it's just a characteristic. Maybe it's some doubt, unbelief. Maybe it's some fears. Maybe it's some hurts, some pains. Maybe it's a stronghold in your life that you're having trouble overcoming. He could, come on, don't ask God for power. Come on, ask Him for mercy. Don't ask Him for anointing. Ask Him for mercy. Cover me in your blood, God. the blood of Calvary cover me. As you come, would you come all the way to the front and make room for those that would want to come? And if you have family, would you come as a family group? We're still trying to be safe here, but I'm just ask you to don't block the aisle there. Just let, let those that are hungry, let those that would like to come, just come together. Come on. Would you just lift your hands to God and ask Him, God, mercy God I want to be anointed I I want to walk in power and dominion I I want to be transformed by the spirit but God I realize that there's some things in me maybe I have walked past the cross when I should have stopped and humbled myself and allowed that blood that was shed to cover me and cleanse me from my wrongs and even my self righteousness God because it's as filthy rags before you God, I need you. God, I need you. I depend upon your mercies. I need your mercies. 
I thank you that you make them new every day because every day that I wake up, God, is a brand new test. It's a brand new trial. God, I want to walk in grace. I want to walk in, a, in that anointing. But God, I realize that I have to have the blood applied. And God, from this day forward, I will not be ashamed to come before the throne of grace. But I will come boldly. I will come confidently, realizing that you know I'm human. I know and oh God that you realize that I'm not God and I'm not perfect. I'm just called to perfection. But the only way I can get perfect is to obtain mercy. The only way I can get your righteousness imputed into my life is first for me to have your mercies, oh God, surround me and cover me. God, have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, God. Let the mercies of God flood over us each and every day. God, let it comfort us. Let it keep us close. Never let us feel guilty for asking for your mercy. Never let us feel, oh God, as if we have fallen short because we come to you asking for mercy. God, we're doing the right thing when we come before your presence. Lord God, we're doing the right thing when I come before you looking for your mercies. I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm doing what you called me to do. God, if I will continue to be flooded by your mercies, then God, your grace will begin to operate. If I'll keep looking to you, the author and the finisher of my faith, the mercy and the grace, the hope, oh God, the peace for yesterday and hope for tomorrow. God, they will come hand in hand. I won't have to make grace work. I let mercy have its way. I let mercy cover me. I let mercy, oh God, cover yesterday. And by the faith of God, grace will meet me tomorrow. Grace will operate in my life tomorrow. God, I won't have to make it work. It'll just happen. Lord Jesus, allow it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
our capacity to even begin to imagine the depth and the magnitude of the love and the grace of God is beyond us. The scripture said his ways are past or beyond finding out. I don't know about you, but that's reassuring to me. Because there's times that I imagine that I've gone beyond it. But when I read the word, hmm, the prophet said in Lamentations 3, and I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, or you could insert my fault, my failure, my weakness, my sin. He said, my soul hath them still in remembrance, and my soul is humbled in me. But he said, when all that happens, this I recall to mind, therefore have I hope. Brothers and sisters, you got to recall to mind, not what the enemy's speaking and not what's echoing in your human mind, but what does, thus saith the word of God. He said, it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Therefore, the Lord is my portion, saith my soul, and I will hope in him. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Come on, the Word of God. Thank you, Pastor. Get it deep in your soul. The mercies of God. Phillips, Craig, and Dean used to sing a song, Mercy Came Running. Like a prisoner set free. Can you imagine a prisoner set free and just bolting out of the gates? Mercy came running. He said, like a prisoner set free. Past all my failures to the point of my need. And when the sin that I carried was all that I could see. And when I could not reach mercy. Mercy came running to me. Oh, thank God for your mercy. It's ocean deep, God. We can swim. We can, Lord, just bask and float in the goodness and the mercy of our awesome God. Thank you, Jesus, for mercy and love and grace. Amen, amen. Oh, it's good to be back in the house of the Lord with you again. Before we're dismissed, I want to address something a little more on the practical side. Um. As of this weekend, we are now 10 months into this crazy pandemic. Is there anybody here that does not know what asymptomatic means? After 10 months, we all ought to know that you can have the coronavirus and not show a single symptom. So I want to address some things. We are still bound. How many of you have not yet tested positive for the coronavirus? I've got my hand in the air because I have not yet. So there's a good probably 50% in the house tonight that have not tested positive. That means you and I can still get the virus. It may not be serious. We may not show a symptom, but you can get it. And if you get it, you can spread it. And so the responsible thing to do if you get it, or even if you come in contact with somebody, this is why I want to address this. We are following the CDC guidelines. If you go to cdc.gov and look up their guidelines for uh, quarantining, if you come in contact with someone that is confirmed to have, or you find out later that you've been in contact with somebody that is confirmed to have COVID, then you have to quarantine for 14 days after that encounter. Now, let me clarify what it means to come in close contact. That means you have to be closer than six feet to that person for 15 minutes or more. Doesn't mean you pass them in the hallway or you saw them and spoke to them from a distance. If you're closer than fifth or six feet for 15 minutes or more, or they somehow sneezed, coughed, or somehow passed bodily fluids to you, then you were in close contact with that individual. 
So if you are in close contact with somebody who's confirmed to have COVID, you have to quarantine for 14 days after the last time that you were in close contact with them. The only way to shorten that is after five days of that contact, because it takes up to five days for the virus to germinate. After five days, you can go get a test. And if you test negative after five days, then you're free to come out of quarantine. So my, I'm sharing that with you so you all know that just because we're back in service and we're doing our best to move beyond this, we aren't beyond it yet. We had a family last weekend that had to quarantine. We've got two families this weekend that are in quarantine because of close contact. It's not your fault if that happens. It's bound to happen. If you get it and spread it unbeknownst to you, that's not your fault. But if you came in contact with somebody and you knew it, and you did not quarantine and you did spread it, that's your fault. And we're going to be some hot in this place if a breakout happens and you knew about it. If you didn't know about it, you can't do anything about that. But as soon as you find out, it's the responsible thing to do to quarantine and get a test and follow the CDC guidelines. Now, I promise you, I am as sick and tired of this coronavirus as the person that is the most. We've measured right up. There's a, the meter only tops out. And I guarantee you that a good portion of us are there. But brothers and sisters, it's where we are. And we do still have to be responsible. So I ask you to please be responsible. We've opened the altars. Appreciate you coming as family. Distancing the best as you can. After service, I do ask that you, I know we can't, it's cold outside. And we do want to fellowship. If you are comfortable doing that. Please keep your mask on and distance as much as possible. We want to not only protect ourselves from the virus, but we want to protect our testimony as well. So God bless you. Thank you for complying with those things. If there's any questions about that, one other thing. If you know that you've come in close contact with, the, with somebody, if you would contact either a member of the pastoral staff or your care minister, we want to keep tabs on that as well. So one, we know why people are not in service. And two, if we need to do some contact tracing, we can do that as well. It's just the world that we live in, brothers and sisters. We love you all. God bless you. Go in the goodness of the Lord. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.